Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Many of you, like me, are looking for the rapture to occur. So we are going to interrupt our regular programming to bring you this rapture update. I didn't think I'd be doing another one, but... And I know everyone's looking forward to spring, but this is I'm going to be talking about the fall. I guess the best place to start with this uh, video would be to remind you that there, there arose in the latter stages of the Greek kingdom a, a Gentile ruler named uh, Antiochus IV. Uh, history records a lot about this uh, despicable character. But what's more remarkable is the prophetic anticipation of Antichrist. In Daniel 7 and 8, uh, we see the two little horns appear. Uh, with one deliberately anticipatory of the other. Chapters 11 and 12 foretell the reign of the Seleucid dynasty culminating in the cruel reign of Antiochus IV. Uh, through chapter 11 uh, and uh, according to most students of the passage. Now, the focus then, though, shifts abruptly to the end times Antichrist. Uh, chapter 11 and end of 11 and beginning of chapter 12. Now we're going to focus really only on the first of these passages, but it's important, it's really important, folks, that we note that these two extended sections of Daniel, chapters 7 and 8, are framed to emphasize dramatically that God has allowed this despicable guy, Antiochus, to live out his illustrious career in order to prepare people for the coming of the latter end days Antichrist. Many of you have read about the two little horns. Uh, Dan Daniel 7 foretells four, it foretells, talks about four Gentile kingdoms, Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Daniel 8 is, is very explicit that the vision recorded there concerns two of these kingdoms, Medo-Persia, the ram, and Greece, the male goat. And as we finish reading Daniel chapter 7, we are struck, or we ought to be, uh, by the, the rage and the arrogance of the little horn that arises from the fourth beast in the end times. Of course, we as believers in Christ, we won't be here for the, during that seven-year period. But as we move on to Daniel 8, we are startled again to encounter another little horn. And it's similar to the first, but it's also extremely different. Daniel 7, uh, Daniel chapter 7, we're looking at the Antichrist. A man of awful cruelty. Uh, violence, you know, he, he rips up three of the horns or the kings that appeared before he did. You know, he has the eyes of a man. He sees all things from a human perspective. He has no guard, zero regard, l concern for God or his law or his people. He is uh, stunningly blasphemous and he's defiant of God with a mouth that speaks great words of blasphemy against God. Now, he takes his... The, uh, he continues to blaspheme, and, and, and it amazes Daniel. If you read there, uh, Daniel's amazement, and it, he grows to great fame. He has celebrity. He has power. He's greater than all his all his contemporaries. He makes war with Israel, he, and he cruelly prevails against Israel until, until deliverance comes, and his, God's people cry out for deliverance. In Daniel chapter 8, uh, we're looking at Antiochus Epiphanes. He's a man of uh, awful cruelty and violence who destroys uh, just about everything he sees. And 
he has he's described as, as having fierce uh, countenance he he understands uh, sinister schemes and he causes deceit to prosper under his rule uh, he exalts himself in his heart uh, and he, he even rises against the prince of princes this is the culmination of a vision that caused Daniel to faint and it actually left him sick for many days I want you to try if you can to imagine yourself back then there so he's astonished by the vision he grows to become exceedingly great uh, prospering greatly and as many of you know he removes the daily sacrifices in the temple and he casts revealed truth to the ground is what the text says and you know both chapters both of, of, of those chapters were future to Daniel's day uh, from t today's perspective however this uh, villain of Daniel 8 he's appeared but history still awaits the latter-day little horn of Daniel 7 the Antichrist I guess the, the short story is is that God used used Antiochus the fourth to prefigure the person in the reign of the Antichrist he's a type okay after the death of Alexander the Great uh, uh, a 22 year struggle ensued and when the dust settled Alexander's kingdom had been divided four ways as, as Daniel had foretold two centuries two centuries uh, earlier 200 years earlier we know that from Daniel chapter 7 and and 8 the division north of Israel that's primarily Syria was ruled by a general named Seleucus Antiochus the fourth the eighth king in the Seleucid line and he ruled from 175 BC to 164 BC 164 BC he was he was a treacherous monarch who eventually unleashed his all, every all his hatred toward his subjects who lived to the south that that was Israel the people of Israel he took the title Epiphanes that it means illustrious one God was very arrogant very proud uh, it's a, it's really a gut-wrenching narrative that tells of his methodical destruction of the Hebrew scriptures the outlawing of circumcision and Sabbath keeping and and the observance of Jewish feasts uh, the slaughter of thousands of Jewish women and children and uh, as a, a deliberate insult the building of an altar to a Greek God in the temple in Jerusalem and the sacrificial slaughter of swine a further parallel exists between Antiochus and the Antichrist as cruel and powerful as Antiochus was God in his providence raised up a family the Hasmoneans the Maccabees as as we we often refer to them who led a revolt that brought the cruel reign of Antiochus the fourth to an end we know that from Daniel chapter 8 now as stunning and fearful as the Antichrist's reign will be God will send Christ we know to destroy the Antichrist and his armies Jesus returns with the church with us to rescue Israel and destroy his enemies we know that from Revelation chapter 19 now the story of Hanukkah is not recorded in the Bible but it is recorded in the uh, apocryphal books of, of one and one and two Maccabees uh, uh, we do know that Jesus observed the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah. That can be found in John chapter 10. But in 168 BC, 
Antiochus, the Syrian emperor. He came from the north, defeated Egypt, and before he could enjoy the spoils of his victory, he was compelled by powerful Rome to withdraw, and angry at this reversal, he came against the small country of Israel. He set out to destroy Judaism by making its observance illegal. He also wanted to move against Israel since its location was strategic because it was a land bridge joining Africa, Asia, and Europe. The one who dominates Israel often has a strategic point of control in the Middle East. So Antiochus Epiphanes was one of the most anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, anti-God rulers in history. He became a ruler in 175 BC. There were several Syrian kings named uh, Antiochus, and, but this particular man chose the title Epiphanes to distinguish himself you know, this is, uh, this is Greek for uh, God manifest, which indicates the extent of his arrogance against our beloved Lord and Savior. Now, in the fashion of many of his contemporaries, Antiochus was obsessed with delusions of deity. His enemies uh, mockingly referred to, to him as uh, Epimenes, meaning madman you know, in res response to his cruelty. The guy was very, very cruel. He tried to Hellenize Israel. He looked on Hellenization as a way of integrating the Jews into his empire socially and therefore unifying the empire. Now, in Antiochus' attempt to destroy the worship of the one God and to destroy the Levitical sacrificial system, he sends an army to Jerusalem to, to dedicate the temple to the gods of Olympia and Zeus in December. Okay. Uh, I believe it was some 168 B.C., some say 167 B.C organized an attack on Jerusalem on the Sabbath, knowing that the Jews wouldn't fight. You know, you can't pick up sticks on the Sabbath. Destroyed much of the city, slaughtered men, women, and children, just defiled the Jewish temple by offering a pig on the altar to Zeus and Olympia, and and sprinkled its blood in the Holy of Holies. The uh, swine's blood was poured on the Holy Scrolls of the Law. The scrolls containing the Word of God were then ripped in pieces and burned. He enslaved and he murdered many Jewish people. He also ordered many altars to be erected and just in in every town, his troops then ordered all local communities to worship and, and, and eat the flesh of pigs in order to prove their conversion from Judaism. And the alternative to eating pig was death. He forbid all Jews from practicing their faith, including circumcision, the observance of the Sabbath, uh, sacrifices. He had a bearded image of Jupiter placed in the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, this guy was something else. His goal was to defeat Israel's armies and humiliate Israel's God, thereby assimilating them into Greek culture. Now, that's quite a long introduction, uh, but I wanted to do that to try to give you some background here. 
So there was a revolt against this, and many of you understand that was the Maccabean Revolt. It began when a, when a delegate of Antiochus IV uh, attempted to force uh, Mattathias, uh, Maccabee, a priest who lived in the vicinity, to sacrifice to a pagan deity. Uh, he refused, but another Jew uh, volunteered to perform the sacrifice. And he was so outraged and he was, he was so overcome by righteous anger that he pulls out his sword and he kills both the, the Seleucid delegate and this blasphemous Jew upon the altar. And so now you, we have the Maccabean revolt beginning. God raised up a band of Jewish guerrilla fighters led by Judah Maccabee, uh, one of Mattathias' sons. And even though they were completely outnumbered, just a handful of men against roughly 65,000 armed men uh, with pitchforks and swords, they attacked at night repeatedly until God enabled them to defeat the overwhelming armies of Antiochus, whose soldiers were, they were the best fed, the best trained, best equipped troops in the East. And since the Macca Maccabees were outnumbered and undersupplied, they turned to more creative devices and, and they relied on their knowledge of the hill country and they employed guerrilla uh, tactics. But of course, um, you can't, I don't see how you can be a Christian and not see that God was moving behind this. So within three years, the Syrian invaders were driven from the land and the focus changed to the, to the cleansing of the temple. And this is where this is where it gets kind of good, okay? You know, there were four major battles against the Syrians before the temple was, was, uh, was regained. But on the 25th day of Kislev, this is on the Hebrew calendar, in 164 B.C., exactly three years to the day after its desecration, the temple and the altar were rededicated. Rededicated. Judah also commanded that the pagan altar be torn down and God's altar rebuilt. And this victory by the Maccabees over the Syrians was just a foretaste of, of what our Messiah would bring. So here's where it really gets interesting to me. Okay, and this, this is what led to this video. You always start with the question, what if? So I looked at this, and I started asking questions like that. The, the rededication of the temple was on Kislev 25, 164 B.C. Feast of Trumpets. This year, September 16 and 17, to the kingdom just happens to be Kislev 25, 2030. It's on, on November 22nd. Okay, that's amazing. Now, the math, 26, 25 days, has the kingdom beginning in 2030 on the exact day that the temple was rededicated in 164 B.C. with a trumpet's 2023 rapture. I hope you're getting this. Uh, I hope somebody... Well, on the first day of the week, the day Christ was raised, okay? This is also on the first day of the week. Trumpets, trumpets isn't always on the first day of the week, but it is here. It is here. Therefore, trumpets would be fulfilled, in my opinion, at the rapture if it occurred, if it occurred September 17, 2023. You forward 25, 50 days, he returns on the Day of Atonement, September 8 and 9, 2030. The kingdom would begin 75 days later, completing that 1335 days, which is midpoint to kingdom. Okay? November 22nd, 2030. 
on, you guessed it, Kislev 25, the exact day that the temple was rededicated in 164 B.C. And 2030 would, of course, make it 2,000 years if Christ was crucified in 30 A.D. Dearly beloved, I, like you, I look forward to Him coming today, our Lord coming back for us today. And I certainly pray that He comes this spring. But if He does not, I want you to know, okay, that come fall, on the Feast of Trumpets, according to the Hebrew calendar, if, if, and I'm going to say it one more time, if we are raptured on that date, the math says that 2550 days later, Christ returns in 2030 on the Day of Atonement, were that when you go 75 days further to the kingdom, we're looking at the exact same day, Kiss Live, day 25, that's in November and December. It's, it happens to be November 22nd in 2030. But it's the exact same day. The kingdom would begin on the very day very day that the rededication of the temple occurred in 164 B.C. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this interesting. I find it more than interesting. In fact, I find it very amazing. I, I, in fact, of all the years I've been doing this and looking at possible timelines, I don't think I've ever seen one quite as fascinating as this. And it all with me began with a question, what if, okay, what if, since the rededication of the temple, which began Hanukkah, which created Hanukkah, in fact, in 164, on, on the 25th day of Kislev, what if the kingdom began in 2030 on that day? What if? That was my question. So I counted backwards and I came back to the Feast of Trumpets 2023. But standing in between that, the return of Christ, not the kingdom, but the return of Christ before the kingdom, it just happens to be on a day of atonement. I hope this excites you. I hope it gives, it gives you hope. I hope it gives you reason to look up because our redemption draweth nigh. We know that. We know that that's true. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.